It's very pleasing to be here um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because it's an excellent paper that, uh, that Terry and um, Andrew had prepared. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing them talk about it. How timely is it, given what we've had over the past couple of weeks? The debate about inequality, uh, Bill Shorten's address to the, um, uh, the Economic and Outlook, uh, Social Outlook Conference, then the address last weekend and the proposal to tax trusts. And can I say how delighted I am after so many years to have the Labor Party engaged in discussion about tax? Because it's my view, it's one of the areas that has been neglected. And because if we want to have a social democratic country, we have to have a good, fair taxation system. So. Um, Still not, uh, not close enough, sorry about that. Touch a lip. Touch a lip, okay. So that better, sorry about that. Sorry, we cannot hear any down here. Can you? Oh. Sorry about that. the front too, if anyone's... Okay, is that better now? Yes. Sorry about that. So I was saying that it's very a very timely debate and I'm very look, looking much forward to hearing from both Andrew and Terry. Um, and as I was saying, it's a very important issue for the Labor Party to engage with, given it's central to a social democratic country, to have enough tax to provide services, but to be able to levy that taxation in a fair manner. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, we're going to hear both from Terry Butler and from Andrew. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Terry first because she's going to speak first and then I'll go on and introduce Andrew Giles. Uh, Terry is member for Griffin. She's Shadow Assistant Minister for Family Violence and Child Safety. She's Shadow, Shadow Assistant Minister for Universities and Shadow Assistant Minister for Equality. Prior to being elected as a member for Griffiths in 2014, Terry was a lawyer and a principal of the National Law Firm Morris Blackburn. Um, Terry has also been involved in Labor's policy development, having served two previous terms on Labor's National Policy Committee and a term on the new National Policy Forum. Turning now to Andrew, Andrew is a member for Scullin in Victoria, Federal Minister for Scullin in Victoria. Prior to being elected in 2013, Andrew was a principal lawyer at Slater and Gordon, Two lawyers here, are good, for tax, good for tax policy, <laughs> practising in employment law, where he helped people uphold their rights at work and resolve the issues they face in the workplace. Andrew serves on a number of parliamentary committees, public accounts and audit, privileges, environment, infrastructure and economics. He is um, within the Labor, Parliamentary <coughs> Labor Party. Andrew is a chair of the Education, Research, Science and Arts Committee and a member of the Economics Committee. So, first of all, over to Terry and then to Andrew. Welcome them, please. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Now, um, I'm going to give this a go. How's that? Beautiful. Great. Thank you so much, Alison. And aren't we fortunate tonight to have someone of Alison's calibre here to talk us through some of the really significant issues and engage on this question of you know, why write a crazy essay that's 5,000 words long? Who does that nowadays? Uh, and why intervene on this topic at this time in this context? So I'm really grateful to Alison, uh, of course, for being here, and to Julian, to all of the Fabians. Um, it is wonderful to be hosted by the Fabians. This is probably, what is this, our fourth or fifth Fabians event in the past few weeks. And every time we go to a Fabians event, we're really struck by how engaged and diverse the group is and how much people want to really spend their weeknight in the cold weather, not at home eating good pea and ham soup, but out here talking about tax policy. That's really inspirational for me and I'm sure it is for Andrew as well. Uh, I also want to uh, join with the previous speakers in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and paying my respects to elders past and present. I want to thank Andrew for uh, the opportunity to come to his hometown and to speak on these issues that are really important. And I wanted to Acknowledge everyone who's here tonight. Thank you so much for coming um, and being out here in the cold. I just want to say a few words about why we wrote this essay, why this topic, and why now. 
And I also wanted to say something about why the Fabians. Why publish it through the Fabians and why do events with the Fabians? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons to write about tax. Obviously, if you've read the essay, you know that one of them for me was just I really needed to vent about Joe Hockey's Rethink discussion paper. I hated that paper so much with the fiery passion of a thousand sons. Uh, and uh, I think Andrew was just sick of hearing me whinge about it. And so we started to write on the topic of tax and inequality. Uh, after hearing that sort of um, the introduction about Andrew and I, I'm not sure about you, I'm not sure whether he's my evil twin or whether I'm his, uh, but we did find that we had a lot in common when it came to issues of talking about taxation and inequality. So when we wrote this essay, which was a bit of a work in progress over a long period of time, um, it was kind of a, a, it almost seemed like a radical thing to do, to talk about the, the centrality of taxation settings in the context of inequality. Because one of the challenges that we all face, people who are interested in, in distribution issues, in issues of social justice and issues of fairness, is that tax kind of has a bad name. You know, the question of whether it's boring is one thing, but I think a lot of people have really internalised the neoliberal idea that taxation is inherently illegitimate and that government spending is inherently wrong and that all cuts to government spending and to taxation are good and positive things. Um, so I think, oh, that's louder. Well done. Give these women a round of applause. <laughs> Can I move it away from my mouth now? Yes. Says, you know, we're all close, but we're getting closer right up here. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the things that uh, we wanted to do was to say, to carve out some space to say, it's okay to talk about tax. We actually shouldn't be afraid of talking about tax. And... It is a good thing as members of society to contribute to that society and to ensuring that the society operates well. That's actually a positive and good thing. So these sound like kind of really obvious things when you say them aloud, but at the time they felt like really radical things to be actually saying aloud. Uh, and um, we wanted to talk about them. As I said, not everyone sits down and says, what we want to do is write a 5,000 word essay. It's certainly not a common, I think, a common thing to do. Uh, particularly not amongst junior front benches uh, in the current um, opposition. I think there's a lot of a lot of amazing policy contribution, but it tends to happen through interventions, through speeches, um, through policy development internally. Writing a kind of a, a long essay um, might seem like a kind of an esoteric thing to do, um, something that you're doing where you're almost deliberately not broadcasting, you're deliberately kind of narrow casting. But I, we wanted to do something long form through which we could explore ideas. And even doing long form, even writing a 5,000 word essay, there are things in there that we really, I think, underdevelop. And if we were writing again, we would draw them out further. Uh, and I think Andrew will probably talk about some of those things. So the process of writing, the idea of writing in and of itself had value for us beyond just what the topic was. Um, the process of actually saying, let's have a long and engaged essay format discussion about ideas. And so when you think about it that way, it just becomes really obvious that the perfect place, the perfect venue, the perfect uh, vessel for, a, for an essay like that is the Australian Fabians. Because it's the Australian Fabians that carves out a space for detailed social democratic discussion uh, and for the, for the deliberate bringing together of people to talk about ideas. So it is really quite... Um, the Australian Fabians is the, is the perfect place to publish an essay like this and as I say we've been going around the country engaging with meetings just like this one talking to people just like you. So if you're not a member of the Australian Fabians just put in a bit of a plug for them. It's a great organisation and it's always been something that's, um, that's been an organisation that's been all about talking about ideas including ideas around, uh, around, um, around equality. Uh, I don't, and I, I wanted to also say I certainly don't claim that Andrew and I are the only people talking about equality, talking about inequality, talking about tax settings at the time that we were putting this together. Uh, and you only have to look at the depth of the Australian Labor Party front bench right now, who have been talking about inclusive growth, inclusive prosperity, inequality, and all of the issues that come with those very broad topics to understand that there is a very, very deep, and in our view, fundamentally based in Australian Labor Party values, 
strain of thought amongst the front bench and the entire caucus right now about the importance of really coming to terms with those concepts. Um, and if you want evidence of that, look at Bill Shorten's budget replies. Look at Jenny Macklin's work that she's done in relation to inclusive growth. Look what Wayne Swan has done with the Inclusive Prosperity Commission. Look at the headland speeches that Chris Bowen has been making around the country. Look at the work that Anthony Albanese has done. I could list every front bencher, so I'm going to stop because it comes to a point where you list too many and then the ones you don't list, you're in trouble with them. Um, so I'm going to stop there. But we have a, we're very fortunate to be, as I said earlier, junior front benchers in a, in a group of people who are very much focused on um, coming to grips with the problems of, of inequality, inequality broadly understood, and also inequality more narrowly understood in terms of economic inequality. Um, so th that's the context in which um, we decided to put this, this document together. Uh, and as I say, there was certainly for me an element of just really needing to vent about how annoying Joe Hockey was. Uh, and uh, that, that you can now extend that to Scott Morrison. Um, so as I say, this was something that we've been talking about and thinking about for some, for some time. We're now at a point where we are having this kind of... Backlash happens very quickly, doesn't it? So the fact that people are talking about inequality is already suffering this backlash, and we're seeing it right now from the, from the Murdoch press, for example, um, from the Treasurer, who, who initially started by trying to deny that inequality was even an issue, that it wasn't even real. Um, the Australian published an article saying, oh, there's not inequality, but even if there was, we should be looking at tax expenditures. I don't think anyone's told them that that means tax concessions. Um, I haven't told them, maybe someone here will. Um, we saw the backlash very quickly. So I guess the, the final comment I want to make about the context of this before Andrew gets up and speaks about the content of the, of the essay is to say that um, we are always in a context where progressive ideas require vigorous advocacy because there is always um, power structures that exist that seek to suppress and rebut progressive change and progressive ideas. And they always tend to, uh, the people who have uh, an interest in, in rebutting and suppressing progressive ideas tend to have a lot more power individually uh, than people on our side of the argument tend to have. Uh, so the act of writing and talking and meeting uh, is of itself important and significant. And as I say, that's really one of the reasons why it's so important to be part of, important to be part of the Fabians. So thank you very much, Alison, for allowing me to start with the context. Uh, and uh, Andrew's going to do the much more interesting yeah, parts now. Right over. OK, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Terry. And I think our first takeaway is we should at least change the format of our bios so we don't look exactly the same. Um, I'd like to join previous speakers in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gathered and to pay my respects um, to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank the Fabians for having us along and it's incredibly gratifying to stand up here and see so many people talking tax or uh, getting ready to talk tax on a pretty cold Melbourne day. And uh, I must say I'm a little bit intimidated at the audience but also at the extensive nature of Alison's notes which I've been looking at while Terry has been speaking. So with that in mind I just want to make a couple of brief remarks about um, the key themes that we've sought to explore in this essay because I think the value tonight will be in the conversation that we have this evening and perhaps the threads that those of us who are fortunate enough to represent Labor in the Parliament can pick up and take away, but everyone can hopefully pursue through the Fabians, through Labor Party branches and other organisations to found what we're really interested in calling for in this essay, which is a different way of looking at Australia's tax debate. And I guess Terry's touched upon her motivations um, for that, which, which are largely mine too, a, a real sense of frustration. And it's a frustration on the one hand at the way in which this government and its leadership have failed to prosecute even on their own terms an argument around uh, tax and revenue. We saw the incoherence over indeed whether the government had a revenue problem um, not all that long ago. But also a bit of frustration on the part of the progressive side of Australian politics, um, particularly for those of us on the left that we are often keener to talk about distribution without taking a wide look at tax, not just as a source of revenue, but as a source of political legitimacy 
and indeed embodying a wider agenda for change. And uh, I guess looking at the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen a really encouraging debate about tax and inequality, but that exposes, I think, how far we have to go because I had the misfortune of reading most of the Australian Financial Review today. Did anyone else? And there was a great contribution uh, from Paul Keating, which hopefully a few people did notice, where he billed the cat on the Business Council of Australia. And uh, their argument, which is of course the current government's only argument for so-called tax reform and indeed for economic growth, which is business tax cuts will do everything. And well, we might come back to that, that argument, but I found that, well, it's always great to hear Paul, but it's profoundly depressing that that's what passes for an argument on um, the part of the government. But the other bit was to scratch a bit below the surface because I think all the opinion pieces in the Financial Review touched on these issues, some going into questions of power at work as well as the tax system. And within them, there was this extraordinary proposition that our progressive income tax system is in fact pernicious. And that was a reminder to me of one of the first things that we sought to do in this essay. And uh, that first thing is one of three points I want to briefly make before hopefully we go into the conversation. And that is, we sought in writing this to state the obvious. I thought that most people thought a progressive income tax system was a good thing and that our challenge should be to make it more progressive. Clearly that is contested space. And it's bigger than that. And that's why in the body of our essay, we spend a bit of time talking about inequality. Firstly, we set out the extraordinary proposition that we think excessive levels of inequality are a pretty bad thing. Um, we think they're bad morally, and we also explore the developing sense that excessive levels of economic inequality, of wealth and of income, are bad instrumentally. They are clearly drags on economic growth and a threat to our living standards, as well as our sense of social cohesion, how we'd like to see ourselves, how we'd like to relate to one another. We make those points because, well, in this room I suspect they are the obvious. It's very clear to me that they aren't the obvious for every member of the House of Representatives, far from it. They aren't the obvious even for some people that we need to persuade to be on our side when it comes to building a, a vision for a fairer Australia. So we make the case that equality, inequality is bad. We also make the case for the benefit of Scott Morrison and um, the editorial writers of The Australian that it's getting worse. Again, we didn't think that would be um, too challenging a task, but I think anyone who's been following the news for the last couple of days has to, has to accept that there is more work to be done. And we do need to bang some of these facts into people's heads. Because of course, a week or so ago, The Australian clung on to the work of Roger Wilkins behind the Hilda survey to justify their assertion that actually Australia is becoming more equal. They confine that to income inequality, of course, beyond that. And of course, the Hilda survey comes out today and shows a very stark picture and a really troubling picture for younger Australians, one of those indexes of inequality that the government is not keen to talk about. So even the government's witness of choice is making the case that inequality in Australia is getting worse. I make that point merely because I think we've got to get better and bolder at remaking it because there are still people who are resistant to hearing it. The last element of this storytelling about inequality in Australia is of course to link it to tax. And what we do is refer particularly to the work of um, our colleague Andrew Lee, who along with Anthony Atkinson has explained that the real difference between the Anglosphere, Australia, the US, Canada, the UK um, in particular, and the rest of the wealthier OECD countries, why we have greater levels of income inequality in particular, is because of the way our tax system is set up. Choices we have made in respect of tax have shaped inequality in Australia. They've shaped it for the worse, and I think when we look more broadly at taxes and transfer, we can see how we've achieved more egalitarian purposes too. So the broader point we try to make is that taxes matter when it comes to making a more or less equal society. And that goes into the second point I wish to touch upon. And this is again a matter that I think we could do more to stress. And I think Bill Shorten and Wayne Swan in particular really 
um, engaged in this debate in recent weeks, and that is that there is a really close relationship between political inequality and economic inequality. And I guess uh, I'm just trying to see the, um, the Fabian's banner, which I guess makes this point reasonably eloquently. I mean, these are, of course, all debates about power. And it should be unsurprising to anyone in this room that power effectively reproduces. Um, but I do think the debate about tax, notwithstanding how many people are in the room tonight, seems to be a dry and technical conversation, or seen as one, sorry, Alison, when it really has to be at the mainstream of any vision to transform how a society and how an economy works. Now, tax, of course, and we acknowledge this, isn't the only way that we reshape power in the economy and power in society, and it's um, the way in which uh, the new leadership of the ACTU have looked to build a really effective campaign to change the rules, building on the recognition of uh, Joe Stiglitz, that, of course, the reason Australia is less unequal in terms of income distributions than America is due principally not to tax in this index, but the, the, uh, the role of trade unionism. We also touch on other forms, you know, informal and formal exclusions. But taxes are particularly important political choices as well as economic instruments to both Terry and I because they are pretty clear single signals of the things that we value and the things that we don't. And I think we have often, on the left of politics, been too defensive in making that point. It's a point that I think we need to re-emphasise. The peculiarly political nature of taxation decision-making, as well as its relationship to inequality. The third point I, I wanted to touch upon and draw out from our essay is what we call for is a wider and a different debate around taxation policy. And it reflects a couple of things. One, if we go back to our bios, we're, we're two lawyers in a world that's dominated by people who are much better with Excel than I am. Terry's actually quite good with Excel. And it's a debate that I think pushes people away because of its complexities and the language of the debate itself. We think, though, to have a narrow and dry view to tax, which is divorced from our wider sense of our purpose and our wider um, sense of Labor's mission, um, sells us and that mission short. We think we need to approach our choices when it comes to taxation with a clear sense of what we are trying to achieve more broadly. Not simply this arid debate about um, how much, where from, and the debate which I think is ludicrous about what's the magic number for a tax to GDP ratio. My answer is it should be as big as it needs to be. Um, but really to start off a different conversation that isn't about just the particular merits of particular policy proposals, important as that is, but to look at our approach to tax as an absolutely essential building block in founding Labor's argument for change. And it comes back to this, for me. The choices that we have made as a society in respect to tax and transfers have dramatically shaped how equal and how unequal Australia is today when it comes to wealth, income, and indeed, wider opportunities for economic dissipation. We can remake those choices, and indeed we have to remake those choices if we are to support the sort of programs that we're interested in supporting, we talk a bit about them at the end. But more fundamentally than any of those programs, it's by sending clear signals through the tax system, through our tax policies, about the sort of society we want to be in that can found the sort of social compact that we believe is modern Labor's mission. So thank you very much for having us here today, tonight I should say. I really look forward to the conversation tonight but also going forward, because um, over the last year, we've seen renewed engagement from federal labor when it comes to tax, when it comes to the policy making of Chris Bowen around um, capital gains tax discount and negative gearing, which is, which is really, sorry, I've taken great confidence in the lead up to the last election about the policy that we took around the capital gains tax discount and uh, negative gearing, which was a direct response to wealth inequality being on the massive increase. In recent weeks, we've seen uh, announcements around uh, 
the deductions cap for income tax management, a really important announcement that deserves more attention and more credit. And of course now the crackdown on trusts. We think this, these aren't policy announcements which can or should be seen in isolation. They are part of the foundation of a different approach to tax and again hopefully the foundation of the architecture of the policy framework that will deliver a fairer Australia. Again, thank you very much.